Okay, we're we're doing an experiment. Um, we've had mixed uh, reviews. Some people, most people say they can hear us. Other people say that they can't hear us at all. Um, I can hear us on my own equipment, but we actually went and ordered like microphones, clip-on microphones, and everything. And of course, we tried to set them up, and and uh, of course, it turns out that this interview kit we got requires special software, and we can't make it work. Well, special app. Special app, and the wires are too short, and so hopefully you can hear us. Today is not going to be the day for new technology. We did get a new light, though. Yeah, we're kind of blind, but we got a new light. We did get a new light. Anyway, hi. Hi. Happy Friday. Yay. It's Friday. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I should get rid of my gum. Oh, I need to talk to them. I need to find Talk to them. Talk to them. Friday, long week. Lots of questions. Lots of questions. So that's because we did two kinds of videos, and I'm happy that people like the other video. Is it too bright? People tell me if it's too bright. What, what, what makes you think it's so bright? I don't know. I'm blind. I can't see. I know. Believe me, I have a blue <laughs> dot in front of my eyes, too. That thing's murderous. Is it a full-spectrum light? I don't know. It came with one of the twirly lights. Oh, Jesus. A huge bulb, too. Yeah, I'm blind. I can't. I don't know. <laughs> See, I'm a fan of natural light, but that's me. But we hadn't been using natural light. We were using the LED light. But it worked. But it didn't look as good. It didn't? No. Okay, well, you folks have to tell us if this looks better or worse than how it looked before. Okay. Anyway, I'm glad that people like the new video series. That makes me happy. Yeah, there was, I was really, I was space junk when we made that, though. Yeah, he forgot to put the intro in. I was like, where there, did it go? There was a whole intro filmed and I just... Didn't. The dog was in it and everything, and then I'm like, wait, where is it? Oh, I forgot. Okay, so we got a lot of questions, don't we? Yeah. So you said, oh, well, let's kick it off. Oh, okay. <laughs> From Todd S. Hi, Todd. How is the speed timer from the motorcycle accident coming along? Uh, it's just sitting there waiting its turn. Uh, I did, I looked at it. There's some good news with that. Firstly is that I went into the back after I made that video and I was able to, um, I was able to, basically, I was able to, the hands were all s smashed flat from when the crystal got destroyed, but I carefully straightened up all the hands to get proper hand clearance again, and the watch runs in both states, chronograph running and chronograph stopped. I mean, it, not just a little bit, it runs. So, that's great news. Uh, also, with the damage from where the watch skated across the pavement, I'm assuming, um, the 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 extra metal got pushed to the inside, not the outside, which means there's going to be some damage to where the the crystal the crystal seal sits, but it shouldn't be huge. And also because the damage is inside, it should be easier for me to clean it up so the bezel snaps on. But that's months down the road. I have so many jobs out of that one. Okay, so when somebody else asks yeah. about it, I will not mention it. And here comes Sebastian. What are you doing? Why do you have two light bulbs? Maybe those light bulbs aren't as bright, but they wouldn't work. No, they wouldn't work. Anyway, let's go. All okay. right. From David Sonboldian. Hello, and thank you for your educational shows. My first question is, what is the lifetime of the oil in the Rolex and Seiko watches? If a Rolex watch was had never been used for 20 years and has been sitting in a box, is the oil bad now and the watch has to be serviced before use? My second question is about the loom in the new Rolex and Seiko watches. What is the lifetime of the looms and if exposing the watch to too much light will shorten the life of the looms? Thank you again. I have learned a lot about watches since I started watching your show. Uh, lubrication rule of thumb is five years. Uh, so the old school lube, the old natural, I'm uh, not lube, the old school lubrication was a natural lubrication, natural oils. And what happens is the, the esters and stuff like vaporize off. And what you're left with is shellac. It's like the same kind of thing you put on furniture. Uh, and so that's, that's, it's not acceptable. And that's going to happen no matter what. The new kind of lubrication, which is synthetic, the whole thing just vaporizes away. It just goes away. And then there's no lubrication. Um, any machine that has sat unmaintained for decades is, we can't, it can't be, it must be serviced before you wear it. And it's just, it's especially for something like a Rolex. If you found an untouched Rolex sitting in a box, 
uh, it's absolutely worth, you, you need to service it. To do anything else would be irresponsible. Um, modern loom, I don't know how long the lifespan is. I have, I have my, er, my oldest SKX 007 has the new loom and it, it glows just as bright. Oh, you need a watch? Uh, has the new loom and it glows just as well as it did when it was made probably 18 years ago. The new loom formulations are, are different. They're not, they, they're not like radioactive or photoreactive. They, they, they give off light in a different way. There's a specific word for it I can't remember. Uh, and so you don't have to worry about those. Um, there was a third part of the question about loom, I think. Exposing the watch to too much light will shorten the life of the No, <laughs> no, it doesn't do anything in any case. Uh, the only thing, even the old loom, it went bad as a result of just radioactive decay and uh, and waste product basically building up from a from the process of that decay happening. New loom, no, there's it doesn't, as far as I know, have any lifespan effect for um, for exposing it to light. Nothing. From David P. Hi guys, I have a follow-up question on watch Can lubrication. What do you use for quartz watches? Thanks. Uh, uh, they there is an older lubricant. Uh, I'm not sure if it's currently being made um, wow. because I have a good amount of it. Uh, but it's it's a it's a very fine Mobius lubricant specifically for quartz watches. It's a it's a sort of a deep ruby red color, uh, and that's what I use. It's very very light. Is the thing because pinions in quartz watches tend to be no, um, extremely fine. Double. Now the reason that lubrication for quartz watches isn't discussed too much is because most modern quartz watches are made of plastic, and plastic is self-lubricating because quartz watches are unstressed. They don't have like a gear. They don't have a, a mainspring pushing the gears around. They just they have they have stepper motors, and there's they really they they're just they they don't have a lot of opportunity to wear now but for older watches like Se Seiko 7828 or the the, the early 4000 4004 watches with the 0903 movements and earlier stuff like that they are they were meant to be lubricated meant to be serviced and those do use those and so when I service older quartz watches that are quality built not made out of plastic I use those lubricants I'm gonna pause it hang on a second we have to distract young man and we're back he has some Cuckoo crackers, and he's ready to go. I don't remember which one was the last one. Uh, second follow-up question on lubrication. Okay. From Dale Taylor Jr. I've I have blah, 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 my late father, 6139, 6017. My dad wore watches as tools, and most have been destroyed on wrist, but this one was in a box after the crystal chipped at the top. I'm going to send it to you once you start taking work again, but for now I've ordered one of your crystals to seal everything up better. After playing with the watch one day, I noticed it's keeping time really well. Would it be harmful to the watch to enjoy its thumb on the wrist before you start taking work? It was dormant for at least 40 years. I, I wouldn't personally recommend wearing it. Uh, I, I've Over and over and over again, I've seen this where uh, a watch like has been sitting for a long time and maybe it didn't have a lot of miles at the beginning and so physically the watch is in good condition the pinions are good and like there's not a lot of wear inside and so the watch but the watch is completely unlubricated and it's not clean but so but then what i've seen is people will start to wear these watches and what happens is that the the performance will degrade significantly and very quickly um it just it's one of those things where it's tempting and you really it'd be fun to be able to enjoy it I don't recommend doing it. Uh, I would leave it be until it is serviced um, so that it's not wearing because they wear. They wear pretty quickly. So, you know, it slept for 40 years. Uh, it, my advice is to let it sleep a little bit longer. From Go Aztecs, the channel is really growing nicely. Congrats. Have you thought about how to celebrate 10K subscribers? How about an Ask Me Anything live chat with Sabrina? I am a really boring person. <laughs> So, no. 
We just, I mean, we do these videos not because we're like, you know, running around back and forth, you know, with flags saying yay me on the top of or it. Or like the, the gamers that Sadie watches. Woo, I'm so cool. I'm yeah. so cool. Watch me hit that like button. That's not a thing at all. The only reason we're continuing to make these videos uh, is because I'm not making any evaluation videos because I'm not bringing in jobs. And we wanted to sort of keep the channel going and stuff like that and have you guys do something. I mean... The last thing in the world I ever wanted was to be famous in any way, to any level at all. Uh, I would just as soon, if I had my druthers, I wouldn't mind. I mean, doing videos is fun enough, but my gosh, my existence doesn't depend on it at all. No. <laughs> um, if for some reason we got to 10,000 followers, I, I guess that'd be cool. Um, We'd buy a cake. Would we? I don't know. I, I wouldn't even notice. Sadie says, how many followers do you have now? She thinks we're like superheroes or rock stars she loves we, youtube she's one of her generation she loves it and she's so like much. my mom and dad they have a youtube channel and she's like how many followers do you have how many subscribers i'm like i have no idea <laughs> none i have no idea i can't i haven't looked at analytics on this channel and i don't know it's just it, for some reason people really have this idea that oh, i'd be great to be famous and have people know who you are i've never seen the point well, here we are. Uh, and yeah, famous for a given value of famous. No one knows who we are. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> okay, so that answers your question. And if she... anybody has a question to ask me, then cool, but I'm not. I, an AMA would be like me saying hi, and that's it. Yeah, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't get a whole lot out of it, trust me. <laughs> From A.V. Cuber. Hi, Spencer. I'm planning... To buy a 6309 7049, but all the nice examples I've found on eBay are in the 400 to 800 dollar range. So my question is: Is there a way of buying one in the sub 300 range and having to fix some parts so that it is a nice watch in the end? Yeah, that's what I always think of as uh, trying to fill an inside straight, which is a poker term. Uh, for no, you basically you need to. Because the spare parts don't exist. The thing is, good hands and good dials and good inserts and stuff like that are in good watches. And so you have to, you have to suck it up and you have to, if you really want one, if you want a good one, you start with the best that you can get your hands on. Um, I mean, this, here we go. This is what good looks like. We have, this is a 6309-7040 from 1977. There it is. It's unrestored, completely original. That is what good looks like. This is a 6309-7049. This is from 1987, and it is near new old stock. Uh, and these, I mean, it's not like these cost me a million billion dollars. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit more money, you know, $100, $150 more or whatever above your thing. But you're going to have a much, much better watch. And also, you won't have any labor involved in time trying to hunt down spare parts that don't exist. Just save yourself the trouble. Save yourself the time. Don't try to fill an inside straight. Save some money up and buy the best possible example you can afford. You want an original unrestored watch that more or less looks like one of these. That's what you want. My everythings are blooping. What everything? My, my phone blooped, then this um, blooped because someone bought a Type 3. Woo. So whoever bought a Type 3, congratulations. Woo. You, your bloop went on the, the video. Ugh. The light! I hope the light is good. I hope so, too. Well, the sun just came out. For now. It's going to snow. Yeah, we got storm coming in. From Bryn Roberts. Hi, Spencer. Is the 4205 movement a good one? They're a small movement. Um, they're a good movement. They're, they're funky. They're funky. They're real, like... Um, they're an indirect center seconds drive. Uh, the train bridge is also the winding, automatic winding bridge. They're good in that they have hand winding. They have a very small balance. Uh, they're persnickety. They, they're, they're, they're a pain in the butt to, to service, honestly. Um, and I, I don't work on them too often by choice. Uh, I have a lot of people ask about them, but I, I just, I don't work on them very often. I have a good number of them, but... Uh, they're they're just I mean because they make that nice mid size four two or five diver, um, and those are pretty cool. But I've I've just had real mixed luck getting good results out of them. So that, so yes, it's a well designed movement. It's jeweled. It's 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 got all the bells and whistles that an automatic movement should have. In addition, it has hand winding, but they're just kind of persnickety. Is that your word for the day? No, it's a good word. It's the word I always use for the four two or fives. Oh, okay. 
Okay. Uh, this is just a comment, I thought, because you like talking about this. Uh, from Peter Chalice, I've been to the Eagle's Nest and Zell Am Sea, where Major Winter swims in the lake in the last episode of... Band, Band of Brothers. The Alps are an amazing place to visit. Oh yeah, I like the Bavarian Alps. It was, I remember, this was long before, before I was married, and I went with, my buddies and I used to go, we'd go to Oktoberfest every year, we'd save up our money through the year, and we'd, we'd get the cheapest hotel room that we could possibly find, and we'd rent one car, and we'd pile into it, and it was lots of fun, but then we would go down to the, because we were really into World War II stuff, and go down to see where some of these, you know, World War II things actually happened, and see this stuff, and man, the first time I saw the Bavarian Alps, and the a area around Salzburg it was just like it was like it was like living in a dream I and I, I still can't believe it. you wake up in the morning and on the in these you know sort of chateau alpy things on the your hotel on the side of the hill and, and you and it's like you you open the oh and you look down into the valley with the red clay roofs and it's just like it's like living in a dream and then you'd leave and go home and a year would pass and you'd be like there's no way it could possibly be as nice as what we're saying no way that my memory is correct um, and, and like one time we had a new guy, a friend of ours come who'd never been out of the country. And I felt really nervous and we're in there and he's just, we're, we're finally, we're driving south out of Munich and we're going up into this same place that we'd always been. And he's just silent. I mean, he wasn't much of a talker anyway, but, and I said, well, Hey man, you know, how, how do you think? And he's like, he's just sits there and he's looking out the window and he's like, man, if anything, you undersold it. And, you know, and on that same trip, I'm looking around and I'm like, even in all of my descriptions and in my own memories, I wasn't able to adequately hold on to how beautiful it was there. But yeah, seeing Banna Brothers and seeing the way that they did that light was just, it was astonishing. It was amazing. Beautiful, beautiful area. Beautiful area. And I'm sure some people there think that dusty old front range Colorado with the tumbleweeds and the mountain lions throwing yeah. rattlesnakes at your face. Or yeah, tumble, tumbleweeds <laughs> and uh, the, the, the national crop of Colorado, which is dirt <laughs> uh, and dust and, and gray rocks and mountain lions and engaged, engaged in fierce combat with, 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 um, what are those, what are those rams with the curvy horns that are up in the mountains? Um, a big horn. Ah, uh, the big horn sheep. So you've got big horn sheep fighting the rattlesnakes, which are fighting the, the, the mountain lions and the bobcats. And they're all and fighting. The coyotes. Right. And they're all fighting each other uh, while there's a fire fire raging through the beetle killed forest where all the trees are dead. Um, and I mean, Colorado was green for like three weeks in like mid spring when it rains slightly and then everything dies. And it's on fire. And it's on fire. <laughs> I'm from New York, and when we first visited, I never left the East Coast until I was with him when I was at a certain age. And um, his dad picked us up from the airport, and it's really late. It's, it, it was dark. It was dark out. And then all of a sudden, they hear something goes thump in front of the car, and I'm like, oh my god, he hit it. What the fuck that? And you were like, oh, it was a tumbleweed. I yeah, we're like, sitting there. Those are real? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, I know. I, so, Dad came down in the middle of the night to pick us up from the airport. He was so excited to see us, and he was driving us in his ancient Volvo 240DL wagon. And and so we're driving. I'm driving. Dad and I are talking. And I look, and there's this like little this like this this tumbleweed comes, and it's it's literally it's tall enough that it's taller. It's probably up to almost the height of the roof of the car, and it went right under the. the <laughs> scared the crap out of me. Oh my God! Yeah, I mean. Pricker bushes and rocks and he doesn't like it here. Well, I like it and everything, but man, I wish it was green. I wish it was green. Well, you're the one that's from here. Congratulations. What are you gonna do? Um, from Super Cruise, Spencer, informative video as usual. I am currently servicing a 79 Seiko 63196000. I am new to watch servicing, having successfully serviced a few 6106 movements. I ran a diafix jewel on the train bridge of the 6319 and struggled with these. Then springs are a bear. Do mm -hmm. you have any tips or tricks for servicing these capsules? It appears you need an automatic oiler to properly oil these capsules after cleaning. Finally, do you have any recommendations on a source for correct L gaskets for 6300 series divers and 70 meter 
Sport models as well as crown seals, would Esslinger carry these tanks? No, the seals, I'm going to go backwards. The seals you can't find anywhere. But this is the thing. This is, this is and this is not me making this up. This is from the Seiko Service Guide. Unless, the, the rubber that Seiko, use, Seiko used for those L gaskets is a different formula than like the buttons and the crowns and the case back gaskets. It doesn't appear to degrade. And the Seiko service manuals say, if unless it's physically damaged, you can rinse it in grain alcohol, rubbing alcohol, allow it to air dry, and reinstall. Um, so unless it's actually physically damaged, you're fine with that. Um, as for the automatic oiler for the diafix settings, yeah, in theory, that'd be nice. But you don't need to. You can also... Um, because you're not supposed to oil the capsules on those things and put them on. So you have to oil them after they've been assembled. So one way to do it, uh, the old school way, is you basically flip it over and you, you, you get oil in the cup itself. And then you use an extremely fine point, like maybe like a sewing needle or something. And you put it in there or the wheel itself and it'll run the oil down into, in between the, it'll, into where the pool is supposed to be. And then you just clean off the excess using Rotico, which is your friend. Rotico is also my secret weapon for uh, dealing with those diafix springs because those things are crazy. And getting stuck in the carpet because your children think it's Play-Doh. Yeah, no, I know it's true. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, those diafix springs, you've got to, I use basically a tiny little, I take Rotico and I get it out to a point to manipulate those things. I mean, hopefully you haven't gotten them pulled out at all, but I mean, the thing is you put any bit of extra pressure in those things, they'll spring away like a tiny little salmon boop, and they're gone. So you have to use the use the rotico to control where that is, and I slot in. The way that those go is that if you get them, the two points right in the middle of the diafix setting, you should be able to basically get those in where they're supposed to be. And then I kind of use a point of something very fine, uh, like a really fine set of number five tweezers, and crossing over that the little tip where it comes up like this and holding it down. I can press it down very gently, again, holding rotico like this, and get it to go click and snap in place. But yeah, they're a bear. They take real work. Uh, CW. I have a SUA 6309 that is not a dive design. Batons for hour markers, day, day, gray dial. Any idea how that came about? Sick or use the 6309 movement and all kinds of things, including dress watches like the one that you're talking about. That's how that came about. Oh, that was quick. Mm -hmm. Perry F. Great content. Really enjoyed it. It would be interesting to talk about the early Seiko quartz watch models. Also, I picked up an inexpensive quartz model number 4004. And for a 70s quartz, the detailed texture, dial, and accuracy of this watch is awesome. Yeah, they're really cool. Seiko had, at the very, very beginning of the 1970s, when they came out with quartz, it was a really big, big deal. I mean, they're, they're, all of their, like, literature to the, like, sales agents, you know, who are selling this stuff in jewelry stores, they're like, you have to, you know, it's an amazing thing. It's like, you, total accuracy, one tick per second, complete accuracy, boom, boom, not like five beats per second, beats per second, six, six beats per second, something like that, but one, so it's like, you can really, really time it, and that was a big selling point. And so Seiko had the very fine adjust quartz watches that did that stuff, and they were really nice quality. And so they had the 2002, then the 3003, and then the 4004. Um, they had twins quartz versions and everything else like that. The 4004s were like an 0903 movement. These are both 0903 4004s. And they are, I mean, Seiko did what they always do. I mean, look at the beautiful blue dial on this thing. This is an unrestored watch. They were only dress watches. They were very solid movements. Uh, really, really solid. Uh, clean, all metal, jeweled, um, accurate. They, they have a really big crystal in them. But almost no one knows about them or thinks about them anymore. Um, but when serviced, they're, uh, they're beyond bomb-proof. They are, they are absolutely solid. And they have some other crazy things, too. Um, Seiko came out with these, and they have triple-language day wheels. French, English, and... Spanish. So, I mean, you can't, I don't know that you can really see it here. So you could pull the crown once and you can see it's flicking through all the different things. They're cool watches and you can get them for nothing and they will run forever. They're really, really cool watches. Uh, the biggest pain in the ass about them is that they use 
This one doesn't. This one's a snapback, so that's a standard, easy, just a flat crystal, uh, flat caseback seal. But most of them use the battery hatch, and the battery hatch seals are super duper duper hard to find. Super duper duper hard to find, and that's kind of a problem. You can ha come up with workarounds, but it still kind of sucks. But the rest of them, and also parts like crystals and things, they're they're hard they're hard to find. I have a three thousand three that's really crazy beautiful looking oval thing it's sort of this aqua like like silk watered silk dial crazy but you can't get anything for it and the crystal's destroyed which is really sad great watches from monkey face senior dainy as you were saying it in japanese would be pronounced more like dainy thank you so i will be calling it that for the rest of the questions dainy that's great and by the way I, I'm no guru on top of the mountain. There's I there's far, far more that I don't know than I do know. So if I say something that's wrong or it needs clarification or you know you have more information than I do or I have put out misinformation through ignorance, absolutely let me know. Okay. Now I'm going to say it right. I'm probably going to still say Danny because it's my habit. Dainy? Die knee. Die knee. Your knee. Your bad knee. My bad knee is dying. Yes. <laughs> oh. Die me, die. <laughs> From Michael Gissinger. Um, interesting video. Thanks. Post World War II recasing of pre war watches was quite common in many Eastern European countries. One, due to the lack of production capabilities, and two, the availability of watches that had been stripped of the cases during the war for the metal. Hmm. This practice stopped in the late 40s, early 50s, when many of the country's communist regimes were starting their own production for domestic market like Prim in Czechoslovakia. That's very interesting news. Yeah, I, I imagine there was a lot of privation right after the war in, in Eastern Europe. I mean, obviously in the United States, our production base... I think the only time uh, the enemy of during any enemy during World War II is able to hit us on the mainland was Japan with their giant um, incendiary bombs with paper with paper balloons that landed in, in like Washington State. So we entered the war with a huge production capability, and so you could just keep cranking stuff out. But in, in war torn countries, they didn't think you may do. I just thought that was interesting. Hmm. From Arthur Fay. Actually, the modern model number letters plus digits existed in the 70s sure. as well. Of course. You can see them on the older catalogs. It's just before the internet, people got used to calling them by the numbers stamped on the case back. But that's the same thing. Okay. The, well, the four digits dash, four, four, 60 through a nine dash 7049, that's the, that's the movement in the casing number, and that's what people refer to them. That Those models actually had, um, they had a model number like, S all L R O five seven something or other, but I think unless I'm misunderstanding, you're talking about the same thing. You're saying they did it in the seventies, of course they did, and they still do it now. I may just be confused. I apologize if I'm not answering your question properly. Sorry. What? No, no, it's I, I no, it's my <laughs> own fault. All right. It's totally cool. All right. Um, from Mark Wilco. What year did they start marking the factory used? My 1965 Seiko has no company marking, but my early 70s Seikos are all dimey. Could you read that again? Let me see that. It's the top one. What year did they start marking the factory? Uh, no, they did. Uh, it's everything I've ever been aware of. They they mark it. Like I've seen, I've seen Dainey marked stuff from the Dainey. early Dainey, Dainey, Dainey from the early 60s. Um, and it seems like it's a mix. I mean, I've seen, they didn't do one thing consistently every single time. Sometimes I see markings on the weight. Sometimes I don't see markings on the weight. Sometimes I see different markings on the weight. Sometimes the inside of the case backs are marked. Sometimes they're marked differently. Sometimes they're not marked at all. They, it seems they changed stuff around for whatever darn reason they felt like. I, I don't have an answer for you. Um, Jonathan G., this is my own perception about Sua versus Dainey. Sua came up with innovative or first in the watch world, such as the 5740, 6139, and so on. They also make workhorse movements like the 6309 slash 6306. I would reach and say the Dainey factory is more refined and better finishes. It's like Sua came out with the first, 
and Diney refined it, i.e. 5740 versus 4500, or the 6130 or 6139 versus the 7018, or 5626 versus 6146, I was wondering if you would agree or if you had your own opinion on the matter. I would think that's true. I mean, SUA was really, they did all the crazy stuff. I mean, they, they came up with the... The automatic, you know, the the, the automatic uh, chronographs uh, the, uh, in the late '60s, they did. Uh, they came up with the world time stuff. They came up with the one button chronograph. They did the seven eight quartz chronograph, the greatest single, in my opinion, the greatest overall quartz movement ever made. They did that. It was the first analog quartz chronograph ever made in the world, and they are the ones that 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 did that. Um, and they seem to always be kind of pushing the envelope. Diney. There's that pronunciation. To me, when I think of them, I think of, well, they did, um, oh, also, Sua did, like, the first uh, quartz dress watches, first quartz liquid chronograph watches. Um, they were always pushing the envelope. Diney was, like, when I think of them, it's like they did sort of restrained, classy kind of, like, dress watches. I mean, they had some other stuff, like the the 5126 sport divers and things like that, which were cool. Um but I guess my impression, rightly or wrongly, would be that they kind of were following behind the things that SUA was doing. But the, you know, the SUA designs, in many ways, their sort of aesthetic is still with us today. Unless you're talking like Grand Seiko or some of the dress watches, which was, you know, you would get, you know, all, you would, you would have that, that grammar design that is, we all know and love. So, yeah, I guess, so why not? But I could be wrong. Uh, from GX9 Super Production, seemed to me like Diney ended up with dominance over the modern movements, but Sua ended up with dominance over modern case and dial design. Many modern Seiko seem to be derived from aesthetic designs put out from Sua, SKX, SRP, etc. Very much enjoyed this style of video. I would like to hear some information about the 6458 movement. You have some content on them, but not much, and I'm sure you have plenty to share. This is what I want. I want people to ask for um, things they want to hear about in our other video series. Yep, absolutely. Um, you're uh, you're right. Uh, that's a good point about Sue's stuff. I mean, you think about the reissues. What's been reissued recently? Well, they reissued the 6309 in the SRP series. They reissued the 62 MAS. They re now they're reissuing the 6105. Those are all SUA designs, all of them. And so SUA's legacy is still with us and chunk it on. Uh, this, the movement you were asking about, they were, it's sort of an interesting orphan movement. And I'm kind of annoyed because I have two of them, but they're literally in pieces. They're right over there. Um, and they're really cool. They were a mid-sized quartz movement and they were this and they were i don't know they were really cool they, they were japanese only japan only but like the movements are kind of an analog they're like a they're almost like a like a 7c movement but like all in metal and smaller uh they hack uh they're jeweled uh they're they're beautifully made they're really really nice uh the problem with the movements is that they come in cases and the cases you can't get any of the parts for like you can't even get the seals and god help you if you need a crystal um i haven't seen a new old stock crystal since uh the last new old stock crystal i saw belonged to um Saul Brook down in florida and he got it from jonathan koch before he died and jonathan koch has been gone for five years or more really yeah you just you can't find those parts they're just impossible but you can find good, complete watches on um, Yahoo Japan. I see them. I have a few here that are quite decent, but not perfect. But literally, they're in pieces right now. From Meltdown GRFX, did I see a G-Shock in your watch box? Actually, we have two. <laughs> One is Sadie's. <laughs> One is Sadie's uh, that she wears when she leaves the house so she knows what time it is. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with G-Shocks, man. I, had, I actually had a crazy limited edition one in like red it was like a like a frogman special i but i knew i'd never wear it and it was brand new so i sold it but yeah g-shocks they absolutely have their place the first watch she ever bought me for christmas was a 49.99 uh g-shock from target you, that's what you wanted i know and i still have it is that the one that was in the watch box mm, yeah i believe that was because uh -huh. sadie's is in her room it is well it should be yeah underneath god only knows what it's in there somewhere i'm sure <laughs> I'm sure. Anyway, that's really, that's about it. Um, I, I don't have plans for this coming weekend for um, a week odds and ends, but I do have plans for an out-of-the-sock drawer video, 
and also uh, yesterday's watch review video because I have two things. Also this weekend I'm going to be taking time and putting more watches on the website. We have uh, one person who sold a number of his watches uh, with us. He's somebody we've I've known for a long time. Brian Sindler, uh, I have a bunch of watches from him uh, that I'm going to be putting on the website. Also going to be putting up a, um, a Mac uh, Mac V SOG 708030 is going to go on the website uh, and some other stuff. Um, so keep an eye out, check it out. As I have time this weekend, I, I will get that done. And that's really about it. Oh, and I've also been making bits and piece videos about the sword, but um, it's still in process. Was there anything else? Uh, I guess tell us about the light. It oh, yeah, tell us that the light works. Because I'm blind. Oh, well, because you're looking over that away. I guess. I don't know. I don't know. It's a softbox light. I don't. I don't know how to work things. Well, I know how to put it together, but I don't know where it's supposed to be to be the most effective. And uh, I'm not getting blinded, or if we should get a different light bulb than the gigantic one that came with it, or I don't. Know. I don't know. We'll figure it out. We're not a professional organization here. When it comes to making videos, we don't edit stuff or plan ahead or script anything or put any real thought into this stuff. We make these videos and hopefully hope that they turn out okay. Yeah, Sadie's like, do you edit? Like, no. I don't have time for that. We make the videos and get on with life. Yes. That's it. Well, thank you so much for watching our completely unplanned and unedited videos. And that's it. Happy weekend. You'll see a couple more from me this weekend unless there's a blimp accident or something. Okay, bye-bye.